Hello everyone. Uh, so, like many Bitcoiners, uh, last year, 2015, in early 2015, we start hearing a lot of talk about can there be a blockchain without Bitcoin? And, and if you read the paper and if you used Bitcoin, you, your first reaction is to laugh about this. And it wasn't until November 2015. And I believe around this time, I heard that Mr. Uh, Mike Hearn, a very talented and high caliber Bitcoin developer, had joined R3. And then uh, it clicked on me. Okay, let's, let's look at this seriously. How, how could banks do this? And everyone was kind of laughing that um, banks with a private blockchain would be no, no different than an SQL database. And I, I, I really started thinking about it. And I, I, I came up with a model of how banks could actually create what I think would be a far superior blockchain than Bitcoin. Um, and I try to be devil's advocate. Um, and if, if, if I were a, a banking institution handling trillions of dollars worth of wealth, why would I let these Bitcoin guys do all of the things they say they could do if they had their way? Why, why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I disrupt all these industries myself? Um, so I wrote a huge post and I, I, I took my time. I suggest you go and, and check it out on, on Medium. Uh, if you don't have the patience to read it, I also recorded uh, an audio version of it. Uh, but uh, this video here is, is a presentation uh, in which I will attempt to show that model in a very, very simple way. I'm actually even going to use Legos for it. So the presentation is titled, um, how bank blockchains can work without Bitcoin. And why talking about it, is, uh, banks talking about it are not that stupid and what advantages they could have. So, you know, you, you hear very experienced VCs, people who have made the internet happen like Mark Andreessen say things like this. And you know what, you know, it, it, it sounds funny and, but I don't think so. I think uh, you can have blockchains without Bitcoin. Why not? Um, so how does the big, the Bitcoin blockchain work? Because there's a lot of talk about the blockchain, the blockchain, and a lot of people don't really know how it works. So let, let's go over how it works now and how, and then I'm going to present how it could work differently. Um, so the idea of, of Bitcoin is uh, that people transact with one another on a peer to peer network, completely decentralized and to transact they use a token that represents value, in this case, Bitcoins. So let's make those little yellow uh, blocks uh, um, represent Bitcoin transactions. So Bob transacts with Ali. They could pay each other uh, uh, on, on that transaction. So Bob's wallet tells all the Bitcoin computers around it um, uh, what it knows. He says, hey, I'm Bob. I just sent this many Bitcoins to Alice. I signed the transaction and this will deduce the Bitcoins that I have. And now they will belong to Alice. So here's, you know, like a little receipt that Bob signs and he sends that to the peers around him um, so that they will write this down on, on this ledger, this distributed ledger, right? So in case Bob wanted his transaction to to be in the very next block, so it could be confirmed faster so she could spend it. Uh, faster, then he could add a fee there so his transaction would be prioritized, right? Um, so one, once Bob signs the, the Bitcoins to Alice, it's like he spent cash. It, it can, it, you know, he gave it away. Uh, he cannot get it back unless she signs it back to him. Uh, so the Bitcoin now belongs to Alice, but the transaction is not yet confirmed until it's written and added into a block that makes it on the blockchain. So most wallet out there uh, will not accept Alice's new receipt Bitcoins because they haven't yet been confirmed. You can actually accept this um, Bitcoin from Alice even if it's not on the blockchain and that's called, I think that that's what we call a zero confirmation transaction. But for now, all she has is just a signed receipt by, by Bob. So how will this transaction make it into the blockchain? So meanwhile, there's these other guys on the network which we call miners. And uh, these miners, they're worldwide, 
and they're listening for all the transactions, not just Bob's and Alice, but yours and mine. They're listening to all those transactions so they can organize them and, and they get to decide, you know, they, they will see those fees that I mentioned before and they will decide which transactions will make it to the next block. Um, but, you know, so, so the idea is, yes, they're, they're going to organize all these un unconfirmed transactions uh, into these blocks and then these blocks need to have this, you see that this block here on the right with the question mark, uh, they need to have a special number there. It's not, it's not easy to build these blocks. And that special number there represents what we call proof of work. Um, so basically, uh, we can explain this in a dumbed down uh, way by saying that they gotta find this very, very hard to find random number. And they have, they have to do this in about 10 minutes or so. So think of this number as something really hard to find. And the only way to find it is basically brute forcing it. Uh, there's, n there's no real way of, of having a, a mathematical function to, to come up with this number any faster. So what people have done is they've created a special hardware to, to try to run these numbers faster to see if they can come up with it. And, and that's what these specialized miners are doing. Um, so if, if they start finding these blocks too quickly, then that means that there's way too much hash power on the network. And then the network will see the average times these blocks have been found, the average intervals on which these blocks have been uh, found, and then it will raise another variable called the difficulty so that this number gets harder to find. Now, if there it's taking them too long to find the number, it means there's too little hash power to find the number, and then the difficulty will be lowered. Um, and, and that number, it's called the, the proof of work no, nonce. So here's kind of like a, a, a way to explain it with an equation. So this number, once you find it, is applied to a, a formula, right? And the formula includes all the transactions that this miner has selected uh, to be part of the next block. Uh, so this number along with the blocks and along with that difficulty number, they must um, uh, have an output that has certain characteristics. If these characteristics are met, uh, if they're okay, then uh, you as a miner, you can tell the whole world, hey guys, I found the next block and you start broadcasting that stuff. And as a reward, you put yourself in the first block of the transaction and you give yourself whatever the reward is at the moment. Right now, I believe it's uh, 25 and it's going to be halved uh, very soon. Um, but guess what? Uh, there's a lot of competition for, for that next block. There's all these guys in China. Um, there's people all over the world trying to find these blocks every 10 minutes. So, hey, what happens if two miners find a block around the same time uh, well, the one that has the most transactions should be the one that everybody else on the network will recognize. And that will be the one that will be copied to the end of the block. So that, that's why we say, oh, the longest chain wins. Uh, this sometimes uh, is in that way. Uh, there's some technicality. Sometimes it's really the block that gets um, uh, disseminated fastest. Um, and then the, the other ones are going to be orphaned. But ideally, you want the, the longest block to be that one. Um, so once you, you have that block, you get your 25 BTC right now, plus all the transaction fees that you decided to add to the block. So that's why um, you can pay more to get your transaction on the next block. If you are a miner, it's in your best interest to include those transactions that pay the highest fees. So the whole name of blockchain comes because you are putting one block after the other and the next block is only valid because it's point, it, it points back to the previous one and um, th this creates a chain and that's why we call it the blockchain. So but there's, there's several issues right now with this and Mike Hearn's post uh, yesterday um, outlines many of these issues that Bitcoin is suffering from right now. Uh, many of us can go and try to attack his character or his intentions, but the truth is, I believe, that he's actually giving us a good diagnosis of the things we need to fix in order to get Bitcoin to to move forward, to scale, and, and to be a, 
uh, an agent of change to the whole world. Uh, so let's talk about these issues. At least uh, I, I wrote this presentation way before Mike uh, ma uh, made his post. And, and now that he's brought the conversation forward and he's getting actually people to think about uh, this company called R3, which is probably building a blockchain without miners and blockchain without Bitcoin for banks. Uh, maybe now you guys are going to listen. So the problems are, are, are that, that started um, becoming more evident last year uh, and, and the big fight on the, on the, the community uh, are around the, the, block, the block size. So blocks can only be right now about one megabyte long. That, and that fits only a maximum of, I say, about 4,000 transactions. And that means you can only have 4,000 transactions every 10 minutes. If you think about just 4,000 transactions for a worldwide financial uh, network, this is ridiculously small. You, if, if Bitcoin were to be used for retail uh, or just for online retail, and people started transacting on the change with things like Open Bazaar, for example, um, that number would, would fall very short. And then imagine if you, what if you start having 40,000 transactions um, every 10 minutes, which is not that crazy. Uh, what if you start having 400,000 transactions? Uh, what if one country decides to, to go and start using more Bitcoin because it makes more sense than their worthless currency? I don't know, I'm thinking of countries like Venezuela, which have huge devaluation. Um, then, you know, there's gonna be a huge queue of transactions and for your transaction to get into the next block, you're gonna have to pay a lot more probably than what you would pay today for a credit card transaction. So that would make Bitcoin kind of useless in my opinion. So if you start looking at the average size of the blocks, uh, most recently they are about 80% full. So there's been all these religious debates and, and this has divided the, the community during 2015 and no real solutions have been proposed. And you know what, what we had, uh, con a concrete solution would be, all right, let's, let's double the capacity of the network while we find a real solution. And that was Big Bitcoin XT. And the moment that came out, they started attacking it. People got DDoS. Mike Hearn makes a much better explanation of what happened, so read his post if you have not. Uh, so uh, let's see here. So I, I, you know, you can read the presentation; it's going to be available. Um, so there's other problems. Um, let's see. Um, there's the problem that every note right now has to have every block. Every full note has to have every block. So that's what we would call in peer-to-peer in -peer technology a flawed uh, uh, type of an algorithm. And that doesn't scale really well, especially if on a network that would have so many transactions per minute, um, at least the way we envision it to be. Some of us envision Bitcoin to be, uh, you, like the paper says, you know, electronic cash system. So to me, that it means people paying each other for whatever purposes they want. Bitcoin is permissionless. You cannot really stop people from using it however they want. So um, the more miners you have, the more information you have to transfer over the network. And also the more miners you have, it means you have more hash power. Therefore, you're gonna start finding blocks faster. Then the difficulty gets raised. Then you need more hash power, which is actually very inefficient uh, in terms of energy consumption and, and not too CO2 friendly even at the small scale that we have today. It's kind of a big waste of energy, if you ask me. So then there's the other problem with Bitcoin. Hello, price volatility. Um, it's great for people that like to speculate on the price. It's, really, it's kind of easy money, um, but it's not good if you want to use Bitcoin um, as a store of value. It's bullshit if you think Bitcoin is a good store of value. If you look at the price, um, you're going to lose your money uh, if you buy and hold. Uh, it will come down and up and down and up and down. So uh, I, I don't recommend you store any of your wealth if you need it in Bitcoin. If you have money to play, sure, go ahead and try to make some money, but I wouldn't recommend it right now. Why is this? Because 
bitcoins are created by anyone in the system, right? So by miners, it's not really created by a centralized entity. Um, and then since it's, it's something that has this subjective value, uh, the value has to be determined by those uh, who want to buy it and those who want to sell it. It's basically uh, based on supply and demand. And since it's a tiny market compared to, I don't know, just a single stock on, on, on the New York, talk, uh, New York Stock Exchange, it's very easy to manipulate. Somebody with a lot of money can go and pump it and then dump it. And that's why we have this these things happening, this, this bubbles every few months or so. Um, so the other thing is that these price swings greatly affect the mining power of the network. The moment the price goes to shit, uh, if you live in a country where electricity is, uh, is very expensive, it no longer makes sense to have your, your miners uh, churning. So then you're giving power over to countries where electricity is cheaper um, like China, uh, and then now you have 10 guys on the stage who control 95% of the power uh, of the hash, hash power of the network. That to me is, is centralization. Um, and, and, and they are vetoing the, the possibility of the network to grow. Uh, they, they, they have limits there. They are censored by their government. Uh, perhaps they can go to two, four, even eight megabytes, but that's only eight times more transactions that that's just I don't know 32,000 transactions every 10 minutes that's still nothing in the grand scheme of things that will not change anything um, and then um, remaining my miners get bigger they well you get it so it kind of becomes a, a centralized minting thing they're minting Bitcoin in a centralized way and this is a problem we want Bitcoin to be as decentralized as possible um, so what Bitcoin has done is shown us what a blockchain can do. It's available 24 seven worldwide. Now imagine if the price of Bitcoin were stable, if you could have the Bitcoin network available to everyone in the world, if you could really offer it to the unbanked that Andreas has told us about and who made us dream about Bitcoin and then you figure out you can only with fucking 4,000 transactions every 10 minutes. Uh, if it were everywhere there, why the hell on earth would you leave your money in a bank paying fees or minimum uh, balance fees? You would, you would just move your money over to Bitcoin and why would you save money elsewhere um, if you could do it with Bitcoin? But right now you can't, it's too unstable. The price of that token is unstable, so you cannot do it. Um, Bitcoin has shown us that if it would be stable, scalable and ubiquitous, you could have people sending money worldwide. International remittance uh, companies would be unnecessary. You would not need Zoom or Western Union or wire transfers or any of that crap that is super expensive and slow. Um, you wouldn't need debit cards. Why would you need that? Um, hell, Bitcoin has shown us that you can transact in any amount. It has shown us that we can transact from cents, from pennies, to millions of dollars without asking anybody for permission and we can do this instantly. But again, it's not everywhere. So we cannot really do it on a large scale. Not everybody will accept Bitcoins. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, but if it did, if everyone did, imagine all, all the transaction volume that, that, that would happen, it would explode. So again, 4,000, 40,000, 400,000 transactions every 10 minutes is still nothing. You need this thing to scale, uh, uh, but it can't. It's on deadlock right now. People cannot even agree on the little block size. How the fuck are they going to figure out how to, to um, make it uh, so that it can scale it the way we need to? Um, and even if we did, uh, the, the human aspect of it, getting everyone to, to have consensus is, is proving to be very, very hard. Um, the other thing that Bitcoin has shown us is that you don't need identity. All you need uh, is just an account number and a signature. So this is great because now you don't have issues like when hackers come in and steal all these credit card data. So no identity uh, theft issues. Uh, so another benefit of a blockchain, right? If, if you did it that way. Um, and then Bitcoin, right now we, we try to represent 
uh, money with it, but really Bitcoin is just a token. So you could represent other things like assets or events. Uh, you, you could represent shares in a company um, if you m marked certain uh, Bitcoins uh, in, in a certain way. Like think about the Color Coin project. If not, try to read about it. It's pretty interesting stuff. So what you have now is that you have a smart open ledger because you cannot just transact money. You can also put scripts into the transaction, meaning you can put uh, logic uh, so that things happen depending on some conditions at some points in time. So now you have the possibility also of having smart contracts. So Bitcoin as an experiment has shown us a, a great deal of disruption that is waiting to happen if we were to have blockchains that were stable, scalable, and ubiquitous. So, okay, enough of all this talk. How can you have a blockchain without Bitcoin? So let's look at the Bitcoin model. Here on the left, I have you know participants who want to transact. Here, uh, then on the right, we have the, the transactions. And then we got the miners, and then they make the blocks, right? So on the Bitcoin model, you have one, the centralized token minting because of these miner guys, they create the tokens um, without permission of anyone. All they have to do is prove that they could find it first than the other guy using proof of work. We put our trust in the proof of work mechanism. Um, there's other... In there's another interesting aspect to the Bitcoin experiment. It's more of an economical uh, thing. And this could be great. This could be actually a, a, a huge point of failure, which is the, the finite amount of tokens. Um, historically, uh, we know that uh, fiat, you, you just print as much as you can. You have things like debt and credit, which are great inventions of mankind, which have uh, driven progress forward uh, and credit um, is just the trust in the future you're trusting that you will be able to pay for something in the future so you can put money today so that you can have a future tomorrow I don't know how this is going to work with a finance system like Bitcoin and then if you continue to think like some people do about small blocks um, Eventually, the, the, the motivation for miners is, is going to diminish as time passes. And you need miners to depend on a high volume of transactions so that they can live off of fees. If blocks remain small and you start putting things off the blockchain or on things like the Lightning Network, then you're going to lose hash power and then the network will be, the, the blockchain will be vulnerable to, its integrity will be vulnerable to, to attacks. So, uh, I don't know about this this part of Bitcoin. Uh, people like to think of it as digital gold, but gold hasn't been doing that well in, anyway uh, lately. Uh, so there's been some solutions here. Um, a great solution proposed is, is segregated witness. Uh, it's To me, that's more like a little uh, optimization of the current blockchain that allows us to fit more transactions per block then if you just double the blocks, now you would go from, let's say, 64 transactions per second with SegWit, and then you put another megabyte, you could get to 128 transactions per second. That's still a joke. 128 transactions per second. I bet you can do that in a couple of, I don't know, Walmarts uh, and malls or just like a little segment of Manhattan in the morning where people are buying their coffees like that would make the network collapse. So Bitcoin is really a small experiment. If not, try to give Bitcoin to somebody normal. They will not take it. Uh, so what happens to to that financial provider uh, for the other six billion unbanked? It's not going to be Bitcoin the way it's going. Um, it's very hard to scale under the current model. And we have here a problem. I wrote it already. Um, lack of consensus towards a real solution. Um, and as I said, Lightning Network eventually makes Bitcoin undesirable to mine as a block reward will diminish and most transactions have to be taken out of the blockchain. So if you take the transactions out, there's no fees for the miners, less hash power, 
vulnerable distributed ledger, end of the game. So let's start changing things a little bit. What happens if we take the fucking miners out? Uh, and now start thinking like you're a banker. You're managing trillions of dollars. You've seen what Bitcoin can do. And you think that you can take over Western Union. You think um, you can take over all the, 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 the things that Bitcoin promises it will do. Uh, now remove uh, the finite amount of Bitcoins. And let's change the miners for bankers. Uh, guess what? We already have the bankers. We already have our money in the bank. So we kind of trust them already. The world is churning along. So now think that you're going to <clears throat> have a, a centralized trust model. We're going back to bank. Banks, they, they depend on the centralization of trust. So now we move trust away from the proof of work algorithm and we just decide to keep trusting the banks so you know you have your money in the bank right now you trust the banks okay now let's let's think for a second that the banks are going to give us this new blockchain account right so we will trust the banks and these banks they've already freaking sat on the table and shaken hands and they've agreed to be part of this blockchain federation this is not fiction this is happening there's over 50 banks that have agreed to work with r3 i don't know exactly what the details are of what they're doing but the, if i were a smart banker this is what i would do so imagine now that since you don't have to trust on a proof of work algorithm now you don't have the energy waste or hardware waste of mining you you don't need to mine Yet you could have a huge network of computers that would have a copy of this blockchain, right? Uh, but no need to mine. Now, the only people in this network who are able to create new blocks will be those who have this federated signature. So imagine that Chase has a signature that all the other banks know. Citibank has a signature that all the other banks know and so on and so on. This is what I would call a federation of signatures. Now imagine, that you can move money between your checking and saving account into your interbanking blockchain account. That's that's what I call it, a, a federation of banks, an interbanking blockchain federation. So now remove the Bitcoin, and now you're gonna have tokens that represent existing fiat currencies. So, and this is happening already. You go to an ATM and you have your electronic balance you go and you check your balance it says you have whatever amount of us dollars in your bank account but let's say you want some cash well you ask your your bank to give you paper money well they're converting that electronic token into paper so they erase that balance from your account and now you have this paper money right so they are trusting that they have a non-adversarial device called the atm doing this for them and they settle these in their systems so now imagine that instead of moving that electronic balance from your account into cash they're going to move it into a blockchain and they have a signature that allows them to make this special operation on the blockchain which is adding it could be dollars it could be yuans it could be euros whatever currency in fact now your bank when you open your 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 bank um, web page you could open accounts in every freaking currency because this federation of banks will have their blockchains uh, working together. So this has a great consequence for consumers, which is you don't have uh, volatility and you're no longer playing around with the 21 million fixed stuff. You still keep using your deflationary experiment and governments are going to love that. Uh, because they they keep in power and they they're gonna start moving us into this cashless society uh, so that now they will be able to track everything that we do um, so as i said you will have a many probably many blockchains for us dollars maybe each bank will have their own blockchain and they're going to be exchanging value between one another um, and you will be able to probably query that 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 blockchain uh, 
because it all has to be an open protocol. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So if we all have access to this protocol, then we can build really innovative stuff on top of a financial system, uh, stuff that we know we could build with Bitcoin, which was decentralized. Now we can build on top of banks. As long as we're doing things legally, it should be fine, right? Um, <laughs> so imagine now you have these R3 bankers. So one, you will have multiple global blockchains for different currencies open and open source and get what guess what they're open sourcing this stuff already there's the interledger project and they're they're working on open source blockchain technology this is not fiction this is happening so anybody in theory i think will be able to download or get get a copy of their own transactions they they could query and inspect the blockchains and develop services on top of them uh, all you would have to do to transact is to have a valid uh, blockchain wallet which your bank will give you after you have given them all your information which you already have uh, done all right so all you'd have to do is, is play by the rules if you're not a criminal uh, you should be fine with this and now you will have all these new benefits and people are going to love this because now they're going to be able to send money 24 7 instantly just like we do on bitcoin only that 90 90 percent of people out there don't have a clue what bitcoin is but they're going to see that the banks have these amazing new accounts. Oh, wow, the technology now for money is amazing. That's what they're thinking. All, all banks are doing is stealing the ideas and the, the, the innovation that the Bitcoin community uh, came up with. Um, uh, you will not have coin creation per block. Uh, there's no need for that. Um, what you will have is, is money going in and out of the blockchain with special operations that are only going to be available to banks because they have the special signatures um, so these blocks of, of course transactions will have to be uh, put into blocks just the same and maybe smaller blocks and key blocks you, you, you should read about Bitcoin NG and some of those ideas are pretty pretty cool but I don't think they'll ever be implemented into Bitcoin at, not at least with the consensus nightmare we have right now um, and therefore, you'll if, if you're transacting with uh, fiat, you will have no price volatility. And guess what? Banks will certify will will probably go into bed with the likes of of Oracle and IBM, and they're gonna have special hardware made for this thing, and it's going to be uh, certified so that it it meets minimum technical requirements. So you're gonna have fucking scalable solution because since they don't have to mine all they have to do is sign transactions they're going to be able to sign probably in the hundreds of thousands of transactions per second so how the hell will bitcoin compete if it doesn't change fundamentally the data structures of it of its blockchain um, so now bitcoin could be in trouble right so it, it's already happening it, the, the banks are not stupid these guys have trillions of dollars of wealth being managed they are able to hire really great people they they they, they have all the money in the world they couldn't fucking hire uh, cryptographers that could probably make the bitcoin teams look like noobs um just go to fucking wall street and and go to any any trading floor any high speed trading floor there's a bunch of phys phys physicists and mathematicians and really smart people working there um, just to speculate and not really create anything except um, feed the greed of their owners. So uh, this is already happening. R3 developing open source blockchain for banks. That's head of research. And um, that head of research is Mike Hearn. And they already signed up a bunch of banks, like biggest in the world. Uh, huge bank conglomerates are, are on board uh, with this already. <clears throat> So we know now, of course, uh, they hired uh, Mark, uh, Mike Hearn. This is November. This is around the time that it, okay, if this guy joined, maybe they are building something. Um, and now we see this move by Mike saying he's giving up on Bitcoin. Um, I think it's fair to say that maybe they already have something very, very promising for him to come out and say this. And I actually thank him for pinpointing to the Bitcoin community what's wrong and what we need to fix. I think we should thank Mike. We should not um, 
insult him or anything. Actually, his contributions are quite amazing. Uh, if you're running a Bitcoin wallet on an Android phone, you're probably running Mike's code in there. Uh, Bitcoin J, this is the, the library, the Java library that powers probably most of those, those wallets and many other contributions. So he is now the freaking head of research or technology there at R3. So I think he knows about blockchains way more than I do and you do. Um, and we should take this seriously. Also, uh, banks have the power of, of mass media. They can create fear, uncertainty, and doubt by using our weaknesses. And hey, it did happen. Mike posted his blog post, and minutes later we had a freaking huge column by Nathaniel, Nathaniel Popper from the New York Times. So this was done with anticipation. He couldn't have just written that so fast. They had the exclusive for a long time. This was premeditated. It's clear it was premeditated. And the effect was immediately a huge drop in the price. Perhaps they also were holding a shitload of Bitcoins and they just dumped that shit right after they 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 published. So they, they created a crash. And this is just one of the many moves that are gonna come. So I hope the Bitcoin community really gets its shit together. Um, because this is really going to die. Maybe Mike Hearn is not that full of shit. Um, so, you know, what will people do when they can move their fiat into a blockchain account that will allow them to do all of the things we know we could do with Bitcoin if everybody could use it, if it were stable and scalable, but without any of the hassle of going to an exchange or buying from someone and having limits to buy and volatility and all this drama people just want convenience what happens when you open your chase account and you see these two little things here and you can just move money from one to the other 24 7 send money to your family anywhere in the world for cents why the hell would you need bitcoin so bitcoin i believe has about two years max to scale if we wanted to go to the moon Banks are not going to give up on trillions without a fight. They are taking the blockchain seriously and they are moving fast. They are organizing, they're researching, patenting a lot of stuff. They're building this technology with top Bitcoin talent and hello, a lot of security and encryption talent that they already have. Bitcoin is not necessary for a successful blockchain. You can have blockchains without Bitcoin. Just think a little bit outside the box. I know Bitcoin is really amazing, but it's not perfect. And people, people don't give a shit about monetary policy. They don't know where the hell the money comes from. They just want to be able to send money cheaply from A, B, from A to B. They want to get their paycheck. They want to have their money available. They want to be they want to have credit they want to have the security that if something happens their money is going to be returned interbanking blockchains could do that and more because your identity will be tied to your blockchain the money the moment you try to do fraud or do something bad they're going to be able to trace your your transactions they're going to be able to to revert them and that are more so our window of opportunity here with bitcoin is closing and we better scale soon